we can jump right into it and, and start with the introductions. I could start with myself. My name is Serge. I am a solutions architect, database architect, anything but buildings. I can, I can probably architect it. And I have uh, over 15 years of experience in the BI industry overall. I started in the SAP world with uh, SAP HANA, business intelligence, their webby suites. So everything from visualizations to data modeling to now Snowflake and cloud computing. So I've kind of had both, um, you know, I've seen the worst and I've seen, I've seen the best of the industry and I've really been able to appreciate where, where some of this customer centric, user centric focus has really been paying off for the successful players in the space. And let's hand it to Chris. Tell us about yourself for those few who may not know. <laughs> well, yeah, thank, thanks, Serge, for your, for your, your background. As I would say, uh, similar to yourself, been in the industry a long time now. I started back in uh, Cognos in the 90s. So I started writing um, uh, OLAP and uh, OLAP reporting with PowerPlay and, and uh, Impromptu was their reporting tool back then. And then grad gradually uh, worked in different sort of areas, you know, doing a lot of ETL, doing a lot of database administration, heavily focused on Oracle for a period. And then like yourself, you know, moved into the, the modern stack, which we're here to talk about now. Yeah, you know, some of the, the, the snowflakes of the world, Matillions of the world, Riveries of the world, and all these other um, uh, modern uh, software as a service um, components that make up the modern stack. So um, yeah, being, being in leading edge IT now about three years, we're um, uh, Snowflake Elite Partners and uh, uh, have been with them on that journey since pretty much the beginning of them landing in the UK. Um, I think one of their first clients was Deliveroo that I worked on with them um, prior to setting up um, leading edge IT. Um, yeah, love, love the data world and thank, thank you for inviting me on here to, to talk about one of my favorite pastimes, which is just seems to be data apart from skiing. That's my other one. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna talk about skiing as well there'll be there'll be time for everything so um i guess just to wrap up with me um i've recently joined sql dbm full-time we're hosting this data series and we hope to do many more and talk with experts uh explore technologies and just try to keep an eye on as i said earlier of for those of us who have day jobs and can't dedicate time to explore, test, trial, every single thing out there, just to see what's working, what isn't. So as you know, SQL DBM is a data modeling tool. We live and play in the data space as well. We try to, well, we'll, we'll get into relational modeling and, and how it is, we're, we're trying to unearth the lost art and bring it, uh, bring the value to, to the data warehousing world as well. And we'll talk about where that fits in, obviously, with with the with the data stack, the supporting stack as well. So, hope to do many more of these and just get consensus from from all over the industry. So, let's start, I guess, with with the very basics. What is the data stack, and what are the components, and what makes it modern versus outdated in two thousand two? Yeah, and that's it. That's a good thing. Is you know what's modern two, three years ago, you know, it, it may, may not be modern now. So uh, it, it's, um, it's an ever-changing um, ecosystem and yeah, keeping on top of it and having a roadmap that maybe reevaluates re you know, your, your, your capabilities and how you're using them to make sure that you know, you're, you're always ahead of the game. Um, and that comes in designing a modern stack. You, know, you, you, you design it to have that flexibility to either extend or even swap out at some point, you know, at some time a product may be good enough to get you so far, but you've reached a certain level of maturity, you need to take it to that next level. And um, I, I think that there's one of these, it, you don't go and build a complete modern stack in overnight, you know, it, it's something you build up over time. And to your point there, what are the key components of that? So the, the, to start in simple, and you, you can expand out, I mean, the, the key part is you, you, you need a, a data warehouse, a data lake, a data, whatever you want to call it. And there's a lot of, um, lot of uh, 
a lot of different buzzwords or, or variations, but you need a, a place that gives you elasticity compute and storage for all of the different data types you need to deliver business value for your company. You can you can go into the technology parts and uh, yeah, the more the more the more uh, the more detail part of it. But at the end of the day, that that's what you're trying to achieve. So once you've once you've got that, you, you need to make use of that. So you need to actually get the data in and actually get use of that data. I, I like I like to break it down into into different components. On back in the old days, you know, we were around ETL was you know that was your mechanism. It did the orchestration. It did your batch loading. You know, did your transforming in the application layer and and you know light touch on the on the database you know that world is gone now um you know and and you know even it was badly elt you know pushing the power down but i i like to break it down a little bit more granular than that nowadays so i i think you've got cdc so that's bring your data in via a change data capture route we can go into more detail there there is your el i call it your extraction and load part and your tl your transfer transform and load part and I know we're going to probably touch on maybe where it goes further from that, but let, let's keep it keep it simple for, for now. And you need to orchestrate that. You need a DAG. You need something that's going to sit across that and coordinate all those different activities. So you can get one tool does the whole thing. You know, you can you can start with a very hand scripted, no tools at all approach. You know, write your own API connections. You know, write your Python scripts and roll your own. You know, you could create your own. Um, um, or you can look to get um, over time uh, as your budget for your company uh, allows and, and all the size of the team and, um, and the maturity of that team as well, you can grow that over time. So, um, yeah, if you look at those those different pieces of the puzzle and then, OK, now look, what's the best one for CDC for me now? What's the best way of me doing my orchestration for now? And what's the best way of me doing the transformation? Like, once you've got that done, you need to know. How are you going to operate with that? So then that data ops component comes to into it as well. Is okay, now I've got all these different pieces of the puzzle. How do I um, uh, simplify my route to live? So, okay, right. So I have a nice SDLC process tied into um, business requirements, tied into release processes, tied into it gets the bigger the company gets, the more complicated it gets. Yeah, it, it get maybe some governance thing, some some um, some regulatory requirement you need to commit. There's there, there can be many many external factors that will that will feed into that. But having that good data ops approach, you could even go far as say data sec ops as well, because you know, we, we can touch on it as you expand it out. You you, you want to get more more um, uh, more complete with those ones. So yeah, so that that's that's how I see uh, the. Oh, I've missed one point, the visualization part. So obviously there's no point having all that data unless, unless you're going to give people access to it. So there's, the as you mentioned, the self, the SAPs of the world, business objects, crystal reports, power play, impromptu, OBI. There's been loads over the years and there's loads of new ones as well. And um, it, yeah, it, and it's a changing ecosystem for what, what I thought was cool three, four years ago. I don't... Quite think it's cool now, and and, and there's there's new newer newer ways of doing it. And, yeah. and as you get older and older, what you think is cool, the world doesn't seem to agree with you anyway. Yeah, it is. but sometimes what you thought was what was cool then become well, what isn't cool becomes cool again. Dimensional modeling, you know, That's and, right. and something that we, we can touch on as well. Um, I, I think the key key things all of this is ability for, for your, your business to consume the data. So you need it to be as easy as possible to get access to it. You need it to be easy as possible to understand it, you know, and, and, and the lineage of it, the quality of it, how it's used, um, creating those data assets. So, you know, you're not, you're not having two different teams working on the same things, giving you different numbers. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's a simplification of getting access to data. It, it, it's, it's not all about... You know the, the uh, micro partitions and in, in, in the and, and configuration scripts and all this. It, it's the end of the day we're 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 trying to create something that's going to make the the data world a better place and the business um, more effective. So let me just ask your opinion on on AI ML. So we're in two thousand two. We're discussing the. We're still we haven't started talking about the actual technologies by name, but. We're still talking about the components and we're not including ML in that list. Do you think it is still 
you know, when we're talking about all of these tools, change data capture, data warehousing, visualization, we're still kind of focused on backwards looking analytics and not predictive. So do you think mm. it's a needs based? Do you think it's technology that hasn't quite matured yet or people just haven't gotten their heads around? How do you see it? Re re really good question. And I'm going to compare it to the, the, the big data Hadoop bubble bubble. OK, so that 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 was able to get loads of CEOs, lots of budget to go and do stuff. Some of it probably failed, some of it did quite well. And that, and that has given us what we've got is this cloud computing or, or a software as a service world we live in now, whether yeah, Hadoop was Hadoop, you know, it was it, it was what it was, you know, and but it, it did get us on that journey. So I'll, I'll give it that. Um, but the same thing that happens is happened, I think, for AI and ML. Um, People were, and like data scientists was a sexy job for a while. Now data engineer is a sexy job, you know? So it, it's that, um, the, the, the focus was on on, on the, the outcome too much at the beginning and say, look, we can solve all these business problems, but they hadn't actually realized to do that, you needed good quality data. You needed a good scalable system for it to be on. You needed um, those, those data assets created. You need a governance process around it. And I think, all of those projects have, have not delivered what they what they um, what they promised, um, because the data scientists weren't able to get access to that data, or the machine the machine learning algorithms didn't have a good enough uh, data set that was giving giving accurate results. Um, so again, I think even though it may not have been, and some of the companies might have burnt a lot of money on it. I think it's it's now changed that mindset is a, well, why did it not why did it not work well why didn't it work oh it's because this team was working in isolation and wasn't embedded in in what the IT department or this IT department wasn't embedded in what the business was you know now this world is it's more the, the lines are blurred now it, it's not it's not them and us and I, I always like to talk about it being a community so if you instill a good data community within your organization and not worry about maybe hierarchies not worry about you know oh he works in tech he works in the business we're starting to talk more of a common language you know start to, to work together and understand the objectives of what you're trying to achieve for for, for, for the business and technology supports that and uh, i think something i have to say to any data engineer coming out there anyone working is that you know you, the code or whatever you're working on has to have some value otherwise you're you're um you're just coding for fun which is quite a lot of developers like that but at the end of the day yeah there, there's there needs to be some business business value and and ultimately um d d delivering it by what you're working on so yeah it's always a balance act. yeah you need to r d some new products maybe like play around with stuff but just never take your eye off the end game of that the company needs to make money sure. okay so in that case let's jump to naming some names in, in this space Ooh, I think, yeah, yeah. Uh, on, on the database side it's on cloud computing i think at least that part has been steady and simple <laughs> go with snowflake and you know we can talk about the other players as well everyone knows who they are um, bigquery and, and azure but and redshift still hanging in there trying to, to catch up with what they originally promised but what do you say to people about all the other tools like in the ELT space and data orchestration space, there's just an overwhelming amount of competition. And luckily competition is good, but it also means Choice. imagine, if, like you said earlier, if you're if you're taking that step onto cloud, you're not just choosing one tool, you're kind of looking at how do they all integrate, which one do you go with? And you've got you know 10 different choices in each category. So yeah, how do you stay on top of them in case you ever do need to make that decision? And if you had to do it today, kind of where would you look and what would you, what would be your guiding resources? Yep. Yeah. And you're right. You're always trying to, well, always reviewing and, and evaluating you know, who we partner with, who we work in and who, what advice we give to our clients, because I, I like to say is that you're only as good as your last recommendation. And, you know, we, we are partners with many of these vendors, but we, we, we suggest what's the right tool for the right company of the right size with the right budget. And there's 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 many of those factors that feed into it. So, I mean, in, in that CD space, space, so I've been pretty much part of it with most of them over the over the years because there's been some consolidation in the market as well. Um, so obviously HVR, we 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 
we saw what they were doing, especially in the SAP, SAP world, of being able to get all your data out, um, high volume, you know, just very high volume replication from on-premise. It's its sweet spot. It, it, it's very good for that. It is appropriately priced um, for, for that. So, but if you've got SAP, you've probably got a good budget. So, so you know, there, there, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, um, um, but unfortunately, all that, all that budget goes back to SAP. So, if there's yeah, anything true. left over, you can buy HBR. <laughs> true, and and obviously, then five friends being that other one that's been in that space for a while. That well, obviously, I've gone and acquired acquired um, HVR, which was, I think, I think quite quite a good good move for them. It, they they were competing against each other, and there was an overlap between their two capabilities, but they weren't the same thing. So, I think that's probably a, a good a good strategic move for that consolidation piece there. And you know, and, and Airby, oh, sorry, and oh, I'm going to Airby in a minute. So you, um, Five Tram works. It was a what we saw out there. Five Tram DVT for a long time was the the biggest combination that we saw uh, as a um, for the transformation being done by TPT. Five Tram doing that CDC and EL part in some cases. Um, so saw that as a big big one. And Matillion being another one that we we've worked with over the years as well. Um, I see very very heavy on the GUI focus. But we've seen the market really isn't. Uh, they want that blend. They want GUI where it makes sense. We want code where 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 it where it makes sense as well for people to do good data ops approach. So again, depending on your environment, you know what, what you know it, it could be a good fit. You know if and they got their data loader, a similar sort of CDC part of it as well. So a very GUI focused version. And then yeah, Airbyte. So Airbyte, I, I quite like actually. It was um, I, I come across the guys. Must be well. But it was in the beta, so I played around with it, as with any beta things, community driven, very much uh, um, a um, uh, yeah, ha ha had it had its issues or whatever. But um, last, we, I use it on, on a particular client as well. It, it, it works well. It works well. And it, it's, a, it's a cheap alternative. It's a cheap alternative for some of us, but you've got to manage your own infrastructure part of it. It's not not an as a service. Um, you, know, you have to do your patching, and there's there's probably a bit more controls in regards to making sure it's going to do using a production system that's that's quite sensitive. Making sure that you've got some good controls over over releasing those versions because it, it, it's it's a it's a young product, but not not something not, no maybe not to be overlooked. Um, well, actually, let me let me ask a question around Airbyte. I think it's a really good candidate for for what I was hoping to ask you. It's an open source tool. Um, it's it's very popular right now. There's a lot of buzz around it. What would you say to someone who is, you know, maybe head of head of their data organization, like, or head of BI, with in an organization that's not known for innovation, or maybe just even a developer who who knows this could really amp up what they're doing. How do you sell this to management to say like, there's not even a price tag attached. Just let us take a chance on this and it's going to it's going to be worth our while yeah and, and i think that's, that's a that's a good it's probably how, how it got into one of these these clients we worked with it was because of that you know they, they needed small startups you know people that haven't got that budget or need to prove something you know if if it if it does that and and thereby i'm not saying you move away afterwards but yeah if you feel you need to go take that next level and you've got the support for it yeah, I know they've got enterprise versions coming out, so maybe there's a route for that, for that to be. But or you look to go to the um, alternatives out there. You know, there's um, uh, um, River is another one that um, we, we, we're seeing quite uh, quite a lot of, and and love their vision as well. So um, River is quite a similar interface to Headpipe actually for, for for its CDC part, but it has that whole da da data ops. I like to put data ops in a box. You know, so. It has that orchestration. It does that CDC. It does the EL for you as well. Does your code management for you as well. Does your environment variables and it, it runs your Python for you as well. But with a container behind the scene, um, yeah. So if you're looking for something that um, you don't have to commit too much on a pay-as-you-go basis, um, but you could move into, and I, I think River is a, a, a good a good one to look into. It's it's a similar sort of credit approach to um to snowflake um so you can start small prove out something if it doesn't work you know like like you know you, you do stop the same thing you, you stop paying in your credit card on your pay as you go snowflake and uh, that, yeah you stop but um 
yeah, I, I really like how they're trying to tie in all of those things and and still keep that DBT esqueness, which we see that everyone seems to love. Of you know have, having having your, your ginger templates, your your um, um, your, your, your SQL in in in, um, in 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 requests and things like that, so you can see where differences are. Um, yeah, I I think it might be filling the bit best best of both worlds with those. Um, DBT is actually a, another obviously tremendously popular tool, and it's it's worth the hype absolutely. Yep. I think yep. uh, in my previous role, I think of all the data models I've designed and of all the, the logic and, and coding I've done, nothing has delivered a return on investment as much as me nudging my, my manager and saying, hey, let's get DBT. And, <laughs> and it just took off from there. Like it, it's something that it's not a one-off solution. Everyone will then use it going forward. It'll simplify life. So to that end, if again, if we're going back to this kind of higher level role as like head of data or sure. department head of, of BI, in the modern stack, how much of that experience would you say is, is now still technical, like experience with SQL, experience with Python versus just at least knowing what's out there and spending time saying, you know, what, what's an adequate amount of time for me to stay relevant? 20%, 10% or every day I'll go check LinkedIn and see what the analysts are talking about? Or is it just um, you go out and you hire a consultant? I mean, well, obviously <laughs> I say you hire a consultant, obviously, but, or you watch these videos and insight or, or, or you follow certain people on LinkedIn. I mean, I go back to the community thing and, um, I've uh, over, I mean, the, the world's different place since, since COVID and, and <laughs> hence me never being at home nowadays. But um, um, the, that, the people I've met on LinkedIn and had collaboration with, um, I, yeah, I haven't, some of them haven't actually met face to face still, but still speak to you regularly. So having, having a group that you think that you can relate to and, and follow what they're doing, because what I say a year ago, my, my mind changes as I see different things. So, you know, to, to to keep up to date, not, maybe not go and watch every single thing that's out there, but just yeah, fo follow people that that give good advice um, and have got you know, got a got a good uh, a good content that goes out there. So I think that's 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 one thing I'd suggest. Um, but to to your point of you know for your manager bringing bringing in or what what it is, you need to look at. There's many dimensions to this, and this is what I probably say to the consultant. But yeah, you know, it depends on the size of your organisation, your budget, the skill set of the people. And something I'm working on at the moment is is um, helping scope some some courses for data engineers. And we were looking at the syllabus of what we we're putting on it. And um, I, I do some stuff with a guy called Joe Reese as well, in and uh, Matt uh, Turnery and um, Turnery Data. And um, we, we talk about data engineering quite a bit. And and we, it, it's it's fragmenting as a, as, a, as a skill or the different skills you need. And I actually got a Venn diagram with three different areas in it now. So you, you've got what I'm calling more of your data engineer, uh, data engineers that are more um, of the ingest part. They're more, more, more on the infrastructure piece, um, more on just yeah, the CDC part, the API part. You've got those ones. And then you've got ones that are, falling more into that data ops so it's more infrastructure as a code they're doing more um the, the cic the, sorry the cicd part of it or the um you know, the, the code management deployment part the, the more the you know, the data ops part and then you've got ones that have that business context so they're doing that dimensional modeling back to that again you know it you know they're doing that good 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 um good practice um you know well documented well structured um uh, data models ah in fact this leads me on to something so a, a good post i saw uh, the other day is that you know why varchar so bad <laughs> you know, so so you know even just stick everything in a varchar so it's a date stick it a var just because it fits is not the right place to put it and and i don't know if you see the clip on it was is that mike renwick did it actually um it, it's basically a, a junior data data engineer Putting different Lego bricks through different holes and saying, right, this is a UUID. Where's this one going? Okay, this is a, this is a number. Where's this one going? But yeah. just putting everything into the Vartar. 
<laughs> yeah, true, true, true story right there. We, I've personally suffered a lot from that kind of uh, laziness at the, at the source layer of, okay, text, bar char, date, bar char. But then keep in mind, Snowflake has metadata behind their tables. They're, they keep statistics, they keep indexes, and some of those work much better. For example, numbers, dates. So the max, the min, they're, you don't even have yeah. to compute them. They're stored behind the scenes. Yeah. Whereas Varchar, you might be now scanning a table for two minutes before you can get the max or the min out of there. So no or, joke. Yeah, or just that's do it. Just, uh, yeah. Or a SHA-2512, see how that one performs on a min and <laughs> max. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, 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 exactly right. And, and, and any people using Snowflake out there, this is something that people moving from other um, databases or, or, or um, other vendors, that it, it's something that, may, that gets overlooked. And it don't come from the old Oracle days of histograms, you know, min, max, as you were saying. Have a look at the metadata that's stored. So it's very easy for you to see it. And it's very easy to understand. And okay, right. If I'm doing some querying on there and I'm doing a concat statement of two charts, if I'm doing any conversion in that, I'm not going to benefit from any of that micro, micro partition pruning. So, oh, it, and, uh, and another one I put is, um, I don't know, it was, uh, you're going to need a bit, you're going to need more compute, you know, the old JAWS, the JAWS, um, the JAWS uh, thing, you're going to need a bigger boat. That's the problem there is everyone just thinks, okay, right. I'm going to stick stick more uh, more horsepower at the problem rather than tuning it. You know, so look at the explain plan, look at the query profile, whatever whatever technology you're using. They will all have something that, that will give you a view of what the optimizer is doing. Yeah, the optimizer is king. You know, look look at that, and it will tell you where you're going wrong. <laughs> or you raise a support ticket and tell them where their optimizer is wrong, which does happen sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> um, I mean. True, absolutely true. The the optimizer is usually well. It should be nine times out of ten your first port of call um, review the the logic, the anything inefficient you might be doing, or you know, God forbid, Cartesian products you might be creating. But with okay. Snowflake, and I really I find it hard to explain to to folks because there is just no analogy in as far as I can tell in the modern world to their pricing versus power um, t-shirt sizes. So in everywhere else in life, you want a bigger hotel room, it's gonna be that much more for that much more. You want a fancier meal, double the cost, not necessarily double the food. With Snowflake, double the cost, half the time, same price, all things being equal. And yet I see people, engineers, developers, they're just terrified of, of ramping up a warehouse just out of fear. It's like, but it's more expensive because yeah, obviously it comes with, with a bigger price tag right on the front. But how how do you look at that? Are you, are you comfortable with working with the with the XXLs or are you you play it safe just in case? I always go six XL now just for fun, you know. Um, yeah. well, no, no, I mean it, it, it's a it's a very it's a very um, it's a very um, Six XL is that quantum or how? What is that? Equal to? Uh, I think it's 10, 10, 24 cores. I think it's not too sure. I think it's that, that, well, yeah, they, they do they do a six XL. That's the big that's, that's the biggest they go to. You know, um, so it it's you need to be careful how you're using these warehouses. And yeah, don't go and spin up a six XL thinking that your your select top ten from some tables going to get the benefit of that. Yeah, that's not good. That's not there's not not the not the time to try and ramp up the speed. <laughs> Um, but but it's 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 having the right load on the right warehouse, and this is something we see as well. Is if you do need the horsepower to do some real heavy you know heavy crunching of some multi million row trillion row tables, you're going to need it. Don't use that warehouse to go and log some information out to an audit table in the same on the same warehouse because you're going to clog the threads up, and it's not going to get the full bang for its buck for the for the real heavy lifting. So. The right warehouse for the right role, uh, forces for courses, you know, have an ingest one, have an audit one, you know, ha have, your, have your analytics one. And if you size them appropriately with, with, with some, you know, some best practice guidelines, um, you, you won't run up massive bills and you'll have happy, happy customers because they get their information quicker and you'll have good pipelines that they finish on time and you won't have um, expensive costs. And there's some really good tools out there that, that can, that can, um, 
um, just help with reporting on that. And first thing is set them up correctly. Make sure you either use an object tagging or something like that that knows who those warehouses are and belong to. And, 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 and the next thing is, you know, put some good monitoring and some reports on top. So I know with their, just the out of the box um, reporting you get on Snowflake, they have some dashboards. But mm -hmm. if you're lucky enough to have ThoughtSpot, there's a brilliant spot app that will just help you dive into every single question you may want to know and find out exactly who's doing what and when. So, um, but uh, Tableau, look at they, they all have them. Uh, I, and sure. Thoughtspot is my favorite at the moment. But, um, but um, yeah, I, 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 there, it, it was very, we spent a lot of time with one of our clients in, the, in, in one of the meetings it's reviewing, reviewing consumption. And it, it always triggers question. Why is that higher this month? What well, how come what are they doing there? Why is the volume down with the computer? And you're able to dive into some of these things and you can find ah, it was running over the weekend that time because of, and you you get you get to find the answers to the questions you didn't know you had quite quickly. Yeah, it's with with the emergence of cloud, I think we were ready to add another ops to the list of ops, which is cost ops. Absolutely. Yeah, no, good, yeah, good that. point with uh, Snowflake, just on-demand elasticity. You know, it's not just you bought a resource, use it. It's like owning a car versus renting a car. You now need to take into account how you're using it, what you're doing with it, and just be with it as efficient as possible, which I still, just like these warehouse sizes, I still don't feel like they've entered into people's mindset of how do I actually track this properly versus, oh, here's a shiny new toy, let's, Let's throw some some queries at it. Tagging, yep. as you mentioned, is is really important to get right right out of the bat. And let me again going back to usage and and how how that evolves. Now that we're living in the COVID era, um, have you seen any change in terms of what customers are demanding of their data? How how they need it to be able to predict, to be able to react. Let's say, you know, there's an outbreak that's not necessarily centralized, but some countries react with very strict measures, others react with, you know, lax and let's just track it. So suddenly monthly targets, quarterly targets, those, those don't make sense anymore. So are people demanding more flexibility, more, just more agile approach to their modeling, or are they they asking are they asking for tools that are able to to handle that? I think there's a there's a selection of a different size companies and different different industries. Um, so uh, I'll give one one example with the worst case scenario, a leisure one. That they 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 realised that there was just so little going on, it made no sense to do any year on year, month on month, or any sort of uh, and that oh. Try and, pre try and predict what actually would, were, were reported on it. Just, um, just look what happened on a day by day basis, but not not in any sort of advanced way because there was just yeah. so little going on. You know, you got down from hundreds of thousands of sales to like three a day. You don't need you don't need the best sort of um, 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 <laughs> system to be able to help you with, with, with understanding what's happening at that point. Um, but then I think that there's others that there was a sports streaming company. Now, obviously, they, they, their data volumes rocketed, opened up new um, new uh, business lines. And yeah, the big focus was was trying to work out how you know, how they could capitalize on that. Um, and and I, I think others, because of the, 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 the way we change our, um, our behavior, money was being spent, cash, good old cash was dead, you know, for a while, more transactions on, on cards. So, um, lot more fraud analysis and things like that but weren't were, were being done by some some companies so um yeah depending depending on what industry depending on what size depending on how they're affected by it they, they all had a different sort of uh, different impact on their on their data requirements but i think one thing it did do across all everyone all clients is focusing on doing something with data you know they they they, they that it either we 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 we've, we've experienced um exponential, exponential growth within 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 the company um, and it's just getting busier and busier and so i think that that's a reflection in um in how much how much there is on a focus of data i think the the role data engineer now 
Okay, before before the pandemic, yeah, it existed. You know, I Square is an ETL developer back before then, but there wasn't it wasn't as much focus uh, as there is now. I and mean, there's a I'm doing we help it well. Um, Joe Reese had been writing a book uh, on O'Reilly's on what's a day, um, a data engineering. I, I helped him a bit on there as well. So there's a book coming out now, spoke focus on data engineering where that you know, it wasn't it wasn't as much of a speciality. I know data sec ops is a book on that as well. I'm not plugging every single book I was involved in, but we did that, that with um, Satori, the um, the, um, the 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 uh, dev, data sec ops sort of like movement um, where they they've got a proxy solution for your data security, a really neat solution as well. Highly recommend adding that into your into your modern stack if you've got any uh, sensitive data and you want to manage it easily and as you know you can do all this stuff in snowflake and, and you can put masking policies and do lots of controls of um, tokenization obfuscation um par partial masking you can do it all maintaining it keeping it up to date as while your developers are still developing new pipelines that can be more of a challenge and it, and it requires some strict uh, approaches some strict controls some good data ops approach which is can be done, but it it, it um you need to help with it. Whereas I think Satori can really simplify that um uh, that approach. So that that that'll be let's, one thing. Uh, well, one. Let's come back to something you you said at the very beginning. How some things either never go out of style or you know come back perennially, like bell bottom jeans. Yeah. But we at SQL DBM, um, obviously, we have a product dedicated to data modeling, um, helping people find data, make sense of their schemas. And for example, people always come to us and say, how do I integrate this with DBT? Because um, I want to I want to move stuff around. I want to change things. I want to build things. And we get it. And there's an absolute you know, use case for it of, you know, you want to build something in DBT. Well, which tables are you going to use? How are you going to join them? Yeah, um, SQL DBM is used that is used for that. What do you see around the perennials or just best practices that never go out of style? How do you do your modeling? How do you convince customers to say, "I know you've got quote unquote unlimited processing and storage in the cloud, but you know, take your time, take the take the eighty percent to plan and twenty percent to execute." How do you look at that? So I'm, I'm glad to say that the days of um, everyone saying don't need to date model anymore, just stick it in a JSON structure. It's all right, you know. That you know we've we've gone past that, and that 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 was you know for a while you know data modeling's dead and you don't need to. So I mean my my view on that is we think dimensionally. All right, it, it's 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 a logical way of structuring data and measures and metrics. It's never going away. And Kimball, the genius, you know, and, and is an um, and in in the as well, um, those data modeling um, books I I grew up on <laughs> back in the day. I was actually very proud. Bill Inman put a, put a quote on, actually commented on one of my posts. I, I knew I'd made it then, you know. Um, but uh, he, yeah, he, yeah. So, so that thought, and it's the same with relational databases as well. Data has relationships, you know. It, it always will. It's never going to go away. Um, how, how we can extend that. To have you know JSON structure in it, which will still have relationships as well. Um, yeah, we we can, but it, it it's yeah. I think going back around to that that way of thinking that okay, right, there are measures, there are dimensions, there are levels and dimensions, there are hierarchies, there are ragged hierarchies. And thinking that way again, something that I've always loved was a bus matrix. You know, so um, anyone that's out there, it, it, it's I, for a while I thought it was a business matrix. No, the bus matrix is like <laughs> a. a, a um, electronic bus so about the old and you, it, it's basically a pointer where you'd say your measures down here your facts are so your your dimensions are off your measures down the side x and y and you say where where they are needed that well, we I've, myself and the other partners in this company we we, we worked at a, a very large well, bmw back 15 20 years ago we built a whole team of three of us you know we built a whole data warehouse that, that, that covered the whole of the bmw organization following that that approach literally adding those things on i think we didn't agile didn't even exist then you know we, we, we were we were working in in that sort of way we were able to do that because we hung it off a data model we knew where we were going and um i i think now 
um, the business has, or the business is is is, is um, you know, help helping helping drive that need for that data, and the business wants to see this data in this way. It it's it's making a um, uh, there's more of a more of a need now for data models than there were before. Of, of across nearly 80% of all our sites now, they, there is a data modeler as part of that that team, um, uh, uh, delivering something whether it's whether it's data vault, whether it's um, whether it's um, you know it's just, uh, st old older approaches of, of you know having having a raw you created and creating some creating some business assets and then creating some dimensions. Depending on the size of the company, and um, I think the data vault thing is very dependent on the landscape. Um, if it's a very, very uh, fast-paced, uh, high change on your source systems or migration, I don't think there's any other option apart from going that route. Um, maybe for less frequent change, less complex organisation, it may not need the overhead. But it's a trade-off, yeah, and um, you need skills for it. it it's a it's a discipline um, that, 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 that needs to be instilled in the business. Um, and, and to your point, the first question is how do you link that up to DBT? I hadn't quite, well, I nearly forgot. Um, is if, 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 you're, if you're building some pipelines that, okay, you know the source, you know the DDL, okay. You, if, if you've been given the target, you are need to transfer it to, and you've been given the business rules to, to, to map it to any of those attributes, you think that's, that's an engineer's dream, really. You know? Right, okay, I know what I'll go to. Oh, just got to do these, these rules. Bang, you know, it goes across. You, you know it's well typed. You know it's going to be, it's going to have validation in the data because you would have got the data types correct. You wouldn't have put a VARTAR for everything. And you would have, you would have got um, you know, validation, it's right dates, it's numbers. You can do optimized queries on it because you have good mins and maxes. So it, it's, it's, it's helping with the quality of your pipeline and, and the data that goes in there. But it's also helping with the performance and usage of that data afterwards. So uh, the additional overhead of cost is paid for in the long run. I, I, I like to say, you know, if you spend more at the beginning, you know, um, up front, your cost may be higher, but over time you reduce your risk. You know, and if you put more, uh, you, at the beginning, you may not deliver as much value quicker to the business perceived, but you'll deliver value quicker later um, at less cost. So um, slow down to speed up. I would say if you slow down at the beginning, get the foundations right. The rest, the rest will build itself, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. I, I, I've screamed myself hoarse trying to repeat that message, but then again, I know I, I work for a data modeling tool, so. Maybe folks. Well, I, I don't. So yeah, so I, I'm saying it. So <laughs> there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, I just believe it. <laughs> exactly. I mean, in the end, it's it's just it's like you said, it's a discipline and it's common sense. It's just best practice. So there's there's no getting away from it, whether you like it or not. In the end, it's it's functionality and just mapping inputs to outputs. So in the interest of time, I still want to leave uh, want to leave the table open to questions. So if if folks on the call want to ask anything, go ahead and we'll we'll save some time towards the very end and now i'd like to go to a quick segment called overrated underrated so as as a great artist i have stolen this unabashedly from another podcast that i that i like so it's just rapid fire questions and you tell us if the thing is overrated or underrated and why okay um, without going into too much detail or feel free to skip. So, and again, not, not saying it's good or bad, just is it overhyped at the moment or does it live up to expectations? expectations. All right, go for it. I'll answer as honestly as quickly as I can. <laughs> uh, Kubernetes for containerized services and workloads. Cool, thanks, cool. Okay. Databricks specifically as a data warehouse. Not cool. <laughs> <laughs> On the flip side, Snowflake as a data lake. Yeah, cool. <laughs> okay. DBT for analytics engineering. Yeah. Okay. I think this one we covered dimensional modeling and the bus matrix. Oh, bus. Cool. Super cool. <laughs> 
data mesh. Yeah, mm, yeah. Uh, it's we'll see how it plays out in 2000. Yeah, it plays out. Fa fa fabric and mesh. I think it just is coming up with too many too many terms for it. Or just yeah. what what what's the business value? What's additional business value it's giving on something else? I'm not going to give too much. Sorry, is it? No, that's no, fine. <laughs> Don't worry. It doesn't have to be one word answers. We're here to have fun. Yeah, no, I I think it's it's uh, it, there are there are problems out there that you've got disparate data. Do we need to come up a whole new term to do it? Um, then I, I, I don't think we need it. If, if, it's, if, it, if you need to come up with that term to explain, to sell the problem. But what I don't like is vendors going and saying they're solving that problem and then pushing, because it, it, it's more of a, if you haven't got data in the right, all the right places, you should really look to try and consolidate where you can and trying to put a layer on top of it is, is May help you the short term, but it help you long term. Um, I, I'm jury's out. Yeah, totally agree. Um, five tram, aka managed data ingestion for enterprise orgs with a dedicated and capable engineering teams. Yeah, if you got the budget. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Oh, you bring, it, it can get expensive. So just um, yeah. Look what you're using it for if it's the right one. But yeah, it, it, it's, it's a good good component. 100% um, remote teams for talent acquisition and collaboration. I, I see. And is very it, important. Yeah, I mean, I do love a good face to face and, 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 it, and it, does, it does work well. But uh, it, 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 you do make some great great progress when you just have that beer and have a chat sometimes that is useful can it work yeah it can work oh, I, i've i've seen the i'm across a few clients at the moment um canada usa uh uk uh, and then some of them mixed teams as well they're not oh, in india as well so type i think the only downside is um is working hours and uh just make sure that you don't uh, this is pre me preacher. You know, don't work out, you know, try and contain your hours and don't do over eight hours a day in, in 18 for me nowadays, but, <laughs> but I try I try myself. But um yeah, if, if yeah, it, yeah, I think I think it can work. I think it can work with my teams. Okay. You need uh, to have a catch up every three months face to face in a ski minimum. resort. <laughs> okay. Um Snowflake's data marketplace as a utility. I like it. I like it. Okay. Have you seen Have you seen people both uh, ingesting and putting their data? It's, on? it's different. Not the same people, but yeah. So so large large supermarkets now using it as a um, a place where they used to get an FTP file and come in and loading it all in, so getting that much real time, and also deli delivering out um, delivering data content back as well. Um, I think not plugging Experian, but I mean, working in the insurance industry, I worked in before for us to go and procure a new data set in Experian and then for us to go and uh, model it to see what effect it would have on on our on our um, premiums and things. And then um, and then find out, I wish I got that other attribute as well or need this bit. And, all right, new request, new load, new data file format. I mean, you can you can be given a good a good um a good range of data to find out what's right for you and and you could you can you can move, you can become much more agile with, with with your with your algorithms and 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 uh, stay ahead of the game that anyone's not doing that because you're not tied to um th those those updates and and the, and the time it takes to process them absolutely and last but not well, maybe least pyrenees as a ski destination uh yeah not as good as the out <laughs> it's, it's 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 not bad it's not bad i well as long as you've got snow it doesn't really matter where it is um i think the the, the the location i'll probably wouldn't is there's um i think the southern southernmost ski resort um on spain is is a granada which is called sierra nevada mm -hmm. um that's probably bored i wouldn't probably go there it's all it's all right if you're down that far but it's it it's um <laughs> it's not quite the answer. <laughs> okay, thought I'd ask. Um, I I don't think we had any questions unless I'm missing some. So unless somebody wants to ask something last minute, we still have 
just a couple of minutes left. Otherwise, what do we got? Why is everyone else considering data mesh as a technology or even a data stack? In the best case, it's an architecture or a methodology. Um, I completely agree. I, um, I there's a tech component to it, obviously. I mean, you it's a methodology that you adapt your technology to. Um, I wouldn't say, I don't think the conception out there is that people are considering it a technology until some vendor comes along and packages data mesh, but I think we're still very, very far from that. What do you I'm, think, Chris? I'm, I'm just waiting for, you know, for it to become a data mess, they'll call it, because like when your data <laughs> warehouse went, when your lake house goes toxic, it becomes a toxic lake. Now it's going to be a, you just have a data mess instead of a mesh, but um, yeah, well, we'll see how long it takes that to go Maybe good. we invented it here, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, anything else? What else do we got? I guess that's it. I think we can wrap up. This has been fantastic, Chris. Thank you so much for your time. No problem. So, sorry I'm late. Um, blame, blame, blame Zoom for it. But uh, yeah, yeah th 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 thank you for having me on it. It's been, a, it's been great chatting. Uh, and thanks for all the questions. OK, thank you. We'll do it again sometime, hopefully. Yeah. OK, cool. take care, everyone. And thanks, thanks a lot for tuning in. We really appreciate your time. Bye. Thanks, everyone.